in a short time. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the South Beaverton NAC. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I think we have met most people here before. You've been part of this meeting before. Um, so we're gonna move straight on. If we can start with the uh, police, oh, sorry. I was gonna start with the police report, but David Saunders isn't able to be here tonight. So uh, I wished him well on our behalf. His daughter is in a play. So I thought that, that was definitely a much better, higher priority for him to be there than here. So. Um, so we'd like to start with Aaron. Thank you very much for joining us. Cool. Well, thank you so much for having me. So my name well, is... I'm sorry, other Aaron. Oh, wrong <laughs> we are, but it okay. doesn't. Sorry. Sorry, Aaron. <laughs> Perfect. No worries. Uh, I, I don't want to butcher your name either. So is, can you uh, just oh, let good. me know once? Yeah, Aaron Zorowski. It looks harder Zorowski. than it is. Zorowski. Okay. Awesome that we have two of us in the meeting. Yes. Uh, thanks. So I'll start out just uh, with a quick introduction. So... Um, I am local. I grew up here in the Rock Creek area. Um, this is my 10th year now with TVFNR as a firefighter paramedic. Um, I was promoted uh, last fall to lieutenant, and I've been here at 6'6 for about six months on A shift. Um, I probably won't be here too much longer. I'm anticipating by the summer, I will probably be moved out to make way for additional lieutenant um, promotees to come in and uh, train here at the station. Uh, to give you a quick station update, uh, since last September, we have a new captain. His name is Ryan Robinson. He's also on B shift. Uh, he replaces Captain Samario, who you may remember. He has since been promoted now to a battalion chief, and he's our battalion chief at the training division. Um, Ryan Robinson has an extensive uh, career here, 21 years at TVFNR, and most of his recent work history has actually been at Beaverton Main Station just north of here. Um, we have, uh, we had no academy last year, uh, which has put us in a bit of a, uh, shortage for staffing. So right now we're running a 25 person academy. It started February and it will go through June 1st. So, um, as you know, station six, six is a, is one of our training stations. So we anticipate getting three probationary firefighters assigned here starting June 1st. <clears throat> Uh, one other thing to note, if you see us driving around, we're now uh, driving a brand new Pierce uh, pumper engine. We put that into service January 23rd. So that engine replaced a 17 year old apparatus that we've been using at the station, which has now become a, a reserve engine for the district. A uh, quick uh, update on COVID. So as of March 1st, we transitioned out of emergency mode and into uh, routine operations. So it changes uh, a few things for us. Um, our fire stations and our admin facilities are now open to the public and we are resuming in-person training, uh, meetings, multi-company drills and things of that nature. Uh, some things that affect the public have not yet changed. One of which is um, we're still not doing fire station tours. We're still not participating in school um, events, indoor or outdoor yet. And then any indoor um, events that we do participate in are approved um, by administration on a case by case basis. So our admin staff is still working toward that sort of reintegration plan. Um, inside our facilities, um, along with the March 12th uh, state mandate being lifted, masks are welcome, but they're not required in our facilities. However, on medical incidents, you will probably continue to see us wearing N95 masks uh, during our patient care and perhaps indefinitely, um, depending on individual firefighter preference as well. Uh, an incident recap. So in 2021, station 66 ran just over 2,300 calls, which averages six to seven per day. Uh, and then in 2022, since the first of the year, we're also continuing at that rate of six to seven per day. We've run 485 calls this year so far. Um, our district wide, uh, district wide, we saw a noticeable reduction in call volume during 2020 uh, at the start of the pandemic, uh, just reduced demand. Um, and <clears throat> since 2021, we have seen that jump back into actually a 10% increase over pre-pandemic call levels, which is what we were seeing in January and early February of 2021 as well. So that continues 
Um, so we're basically back to normal as far as uh, demand. Real quick, I wanted to touch on our spring topic uh, of focus, which is wildfire season. So realize rainy days like today, doesn't make you feel like it's wildfire season, but the season for us is actually starting earlier and earlier and places like California have year round wildfire seasons that um, during non pandemic years, we actually send teams uh, to support. So for us, our training in wildland begins um, in about a month where we will do practical drills and put all the necessary equipment on our rigs. Um, and then for you guys, uh, we have adopted a, a na nationwide program called Ready, Set, Go for wildfire preparation. Um, I realize South Beaverton and where I live in Hillsboro, we are not a wildland urban interface. So we don't quite have the uh, risks uh, to our properties that a wildfire might present. However, in going through that material, there are a lot of recommendations that actually apply to everyone um, in terms of preparing our homes for fire, uh, particularly in causes from external sources. So uh, I'm talking about things like uh, vehicle fires in the driveway, fence fires, barbecues, fireworks, things like that. There are things that we can do to our house uh, to uh, essentially harden it against uh, incidents like those. And then the preparedness side uh, of that Ready, Set, Go program applies to things like a potential Cascadia earthquake event or prolonged power outage, things like that that we can do at home to prepare ourselves. So without getting too much into the weeds, I want to refer you to those materials online. Um, I sent Mike a link. Uh, if you want to write it down, it's pretty simple. It's www.tvfr.com slash 395. And that'll take you to all of our wildfire um, preparation. Uh, information. So that's the update from me, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, is there any questions for Aaron? Thank you very much for that good update. Um, I, had a, I had a question with regards to the number of calls. Have you seen, is the 10% increase in motor vehicle accidents, or is it just... Um, what what is causing that ten percent? Uh, have you got the numbers down at that level? I haven't. No, um, that update came specifically from our operations update, and it was not out to the granular level. Um, anecdotally, we haven't seen a significant increase in a certain type of category. Um, although you know, it, it continues to be the fact that we respond on about eighty to eighty-five percent medical calls, and so um, it's quite likely that those are still driving our increase in demand. Um, and the other question I had for you, with all these new apartment buildings being built, um, has there been any new training that you've had for that? Because there, a lot of them are multi-rise, high-rise buildings. Um, sure. And as we saw in California, when those wildfires hit, the buildings being that so close together, they took them all out in one go. So is there any extra training you're doing in regards to that? Um, yes and no. So. Uh, proximity of buildings applies not only to multifamily, but also all, pretty much every new uh, single family residence um, neighborhood has uh, proximity issues. For a lot of the details uh, on an answer that you might be looking for, I'd have to refer you to our DFMs who um, engage with developers when they construct neighborhoods like that. Um, our target hazards, quite honestly, still are apartment complexes uh, uh, with age. Um, because they do not, uh, they were not constructed to today's code standards. For example, we have uh, multi-floor apartments with no fire, residential fire sprinklers um, and things of that nature. So we still train heavily on complexes like that. Um, my company did a pretty involved training at Meridian uh, apartment complex, which is just north of Shoals Ferry off of Teal Boulevard. Uh, simply because of its very unique um, layout. So we brought in another engine company and a truck company to practice how we would deploy uh, to a fire in that res in that complex. Um, so we still do focus on older complexes simply because of the uh, nature of the construction. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other questions anyone has? Well, thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, I appreciate you coming and spending time with us. Thank you. So if we uh, move on now, um, Holly, would you like to give us your update? 
Thank you, Meg. So hi, everyone. It's actually I popped on and I'm like, I see so many familiar faces. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces on here. And one I think I was in the meeting with earlier uh, this week. So we, we go to a lot of the same spaces. And hi, Frosty. It's nice to see you. Um, I'm going to be your co-new uh, NAC rep from THPRD. So Kristen Preston, who's an administrative specialist with the district, and I are going to trade off month to month. Um, I'm excited to be here because I actually live in this NAC area, so I'm really invested in um, learning all the same updates. So I really appreciate this opportunity to be with you this evening. Uh, at THPRD, summer registration is right around the corner. Um, that turnaround time between spring and summer always gives me whiplash because it's like, didn't we just do registration? Well, yes, we did. But summer registration will be April 2nd. Um, it will be a lot of summer camps. So all the families looking to fill the kids activities this year. Lots of opportunity. Another thing that we have to keep uh, middle schoolers engaged, we've actually lowered the age on our RISE program. So that is a volunteer program opportunity for youth to volunteer um, over the summer at events or at summer camps. My uh, older daughter did it and loved it. And it's just a really good opportunity. The age uh, starting point had been 14. We're lowering that to 13. So for those middle schoolers, right, that maybe feel they're too old to go to camps, um, but they're too young to work, it's a great way to get 80 to 120 volunteer service hours uh, during the summer and keep kids busy and safe and engaged. So wanted to plug that opportunity. Hiring, um, like every other employer in the world right now, is a huge, huge challenge. You might have heard uh, we put out some information and we've been we've done several news stories. Um, some people are calling it an aquatics shortage. I would call it more of an aquatics crisis, to be honest with you. Um, there is a nationwide shortage in people that are willing to come back to pools to teach swim lessons, to be lifeguards. We're offering all kinds of free training right now. So for people who want to learn how to be a lifeguard, we've waived all the class fees and it's just down to, I think it's a $41 American Red Cross uh, certification fee, but that's it. And, you know, just to kind of give perspective, I know everyone says there, there's hiring shortages, but I want to contextualize that for you. This time of year, we would have six pools open in the district. Our two outdoor pools would be closed. And those uh, pools would offer a combined about 50 swim lessons during peak hours at a time, right? So 50 at 4 o'clock, 50 at 4.30, 50 at 5 o'clock, and so on. Right now, we're offering four four compared to 50. So pre-pandemic levels, there were a lot more classes available. So we have a lot of um, understanding of the strain that parents are feeling right now. You know, kids have been out of pools for two years through the closures. Kids really need swim lessons. It's a vital thing. Um, and we are just scrambling to try to hire people to do it. So really trying to send a message to folks if people are retired, if they have aquatics backgrounds, if they have you know, an interest in picking up just one or two shifts a week, that could make a real difference for getting kids back into swim lessons. Um, the, I thought this NAC would be interested in what's up with the Conestoga pool. So the project has been delayed. 90% of it has to do with mat uh, material supply chain issues. So anything you've ordered at home, they've had the same issues for the Conestoga pool, unfortunately. Um, they've been doing walkthroughs, they're getting closer and closer. We're looking now at probably an early April date. They gave me an exact date, but I'm not even going to say that because it's, you know, it keeps moving. So early April is the target zone. Um, when it comes back, we'll still be waiting for the slide. We still might be waiting for the diving board. Um, because of supply chain issues, but we'll get it open as soon as we can. They really wanted to have it open before spring break for the splash pad, but it just isn't possible. So we're, we're bummed about that. A lot of spring and summer normal activities are coming back and will feel more normal. So we're bringing back fitness in the park. Uh, there will be free fitness activities happening through March through May and every and several parks in the districts. So you want to go online and find those. And then finally, I'll say that um, we're starting work with the city of Beaverton 
um, you know, they've done so much uh, dreaming about what downtown, how it should be redeveloped, and so much energy has gone into that in the last decade. And now they'd like to focus on park and open space and what types of parks we want in downtown, what we want those amenities, what we want those park-like activities to be. So you'll start seeing communication and information coming out jointly from THPRD and the city of Beaverton kind of dreaming about do our parks in the downtown core look, feel a little different and what should be unique about them and what do we want for the future? Um, and then finally for your NAC, or I guess our NAC area specifically, I would say that um, we've got a call this just actually in the last week on uh, the Cobb property and off-leash dog activity. So I did get a call and a request from a neighbor to get some signage up there asking people to keep their dogs on leash and we've got safety services um, is going to do a couple of drive-bys. Off-leash dogs are everywhere, you know, and I know this caller in particular really wanted to see a fenced dog park. Just being really uh, straight up with y'all, we have an, a, a strategy right now, you know, dog parks are something everybody wants, but not necessarily in their backyard, right? Not necessarily right next to them. So, uh, we have differentiated and created kind of two levels. You have like your bigger dog parks like Winkleman just down the road. And then we were creating smaller dog runs, which are meant to really serve the immediate neighbors. They're not meant to be attractions that pull people, you know, drive across town to come to. And we're trying to get more of those in. Um, oh, the Cobb property is, uh, Frosty can answer that for us really quick, Sexton Mountain Drive and uh, Murray Boulevard. So kind of think that the kind of going up the hill, there's like a little house there, a couple little properties actually, and then big open space uh, fields. And it, it was bought in the 2008 bond measure um, and is on the list to begin redevelopment around, I think, uh, or development of the park site, probably 2024, 2025, sometime in that time frame. So, uh, Frosty, you had a question? I see your hand up. I wanna... uh, yeah, um, yeah, the, and Holly was amazing and helped us as, as well as Lonnie with that Cobb property issue. Um, uh, the Cobb family, for those that may not know, uh, sold it to the Twelve Hills Park and Rec District to become a park and, and it's it's an unusual piece of property. It's about 8.3 acres, if I remember correctly. I, I'm getting yeah, old, Holly. You're better than me. Yeah, and um, and just south of it, um, there's a house at the top of the hill and there's also a house on the corner of Sexton Mountain Drive and Murray uh, on the east side of Murray. Um, and I think those houses are rented uh, by the park department to people. Uh, but there's also, there was a big, huge, at one time was a reservoir, uh, a, a huge bladder that contained millions of gallons of water. And the idea initially that the park was looking at was swapping it out with uh, Bridge Meadows to build a 32, something 28, 32 uh, unit complex across from the apartments. And if you've ever driven up Sexton Mountain Drive, it's a parking lot already. And fortunately, uh, uh, the mayor at the time, Denny Doyle and, and the Parks Department and everybody really got together and said, uh, we love Bridge Meadows, but we need to find a better place for it. And the Cobb family wanted that to become a park. And I, I still think, and I'm hoping that you may have an update on the next bond measure. Um, I'm hoping that with the next bond measure that could be developed into something um, I play senior softball uh, over in Vancouver at, in um, Cascade Park. Um, it's like 164th and it's almost to Camus. And they have a huge dog run out there that's fenced in and it's used. And we took part of that property and built a, with the, the softball league and the parks department in Vancouver and built a beautiful softball field uh, with fenced and signs and everything and bleachers and dugouts. Uh, it's, it's as nice as our great softball complex out at uh, Turpening. Um, but I'd really like to hope that there's something in the works, it, assuming there'll be a new bond manager to develop that. Um, I, I'm concerned about parking because it's, it's crazy, uh, but there's so many things that could happen. And, and it was meant to be and sold to the Parks Department by the Cobb family to become a park. Yeah. 
yeah. and it's it, I just don't see it being used. At, at least you're mowing it, which is great. Uh, probably the first year to two and maybe year, year and a half, they just let it go, and and the grass was um, uh, almost as tall as me, so, which isn't very tall. <laughs> That's but, not uh, good, Frosty. That's yeah, not good. but but they they came up, and, and in fact, Mike. Uh, Mike and his family are contiguous to that are as are um, uh, some other families that, that are right next uh, back up to it. So uh, something that would be respectful of their privacy and, and property, maybe add value to it, but also it's a, it's gotta be a, there's gotta be something that can be done to be a really great use for the money that the parks paid for it. Well, I, I do have a small update. What, what I can say is, um, I did check in uh, with our planning and design development departments when I got the call this week just to refresh my memory because I, I don't have like specific recall on, on details like that. And uh, they told me that the Cobb property is on our capital planning list for 2024-2025. So I think it'll, that to me that I interpret that to mean we'll probably start talking community engagement and beginning Excellent. to think of it in 2024 and activity might begin in 2025. Now that feels really long, right? That feels really far away, especially if you're like a parent with young kids and you're like, when, you know, my, will my kid want to be on a swing by the time you give me a swing? But in, in our world, right, in government planning world, that's really cool. It's coming up. And everything you just said, and everybody, every other, everybody else's ideas for the park, we just hold on to those because when the community engagement happens, that's when you really want to get involved and you really want to encourage your neighbors to get involved um, and really get a handle. And I can tell you, our staff do a really good job of listening to the community feedback and really developing the design of the park and giving it unique features based on what they hear in the community feedback process. So, and and that, absolutely. And there's been a lot of work already done uh, with Gary, Gary and of course, Mike and his wife and Heidi, Heidi and Joseph, uh, Marietta, with, Involved, so uh, the forgerons, a bunch of us, um, and there was probably over six hundred people that signed a, a petition right. to. to uh, I remember, the one to, the uh, one thing I wanted to, to to clear up though, Frosty, is I don't think you need to wait for the next bond measure because it's on that yeah. list. Okay. What that means is that work is being funded through system development charges, mm -hmm. and that list is itemized. I mean, it's like a really think of like a you know construction or project list. So you're just they they budget every year and they do the next gap of projects. Right, right. And I so remember that. This is coming yep. up in 2025, is what I'm saying, and it's it'll be funded before the bond measure. So well, it's not, you're absolutely right. I think Michael, maybe we should get uh, find out who's interested in the neighborhood, NAC. Um, and see if they're maybe can put a subcommittee together to start to dig up some a nice. I still have a binder <laughs> uh, of stuff, and uh, so you, it's not like having to reinvent the wheel. But it may not. There may be some new ideas too that we can get some people to uh, together to start <clears throat> putting some stuff together so we can be proactive rather than reactive. Yep. Well, we'll be ready in two years. Two years. Yeah, that's that's like tomorrow. That's, that's just two coronavirus yeah. um, variants. <laughs> Sorry, I, I had to put that in somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, we're on the B.2 now, right? Yeah. Not B1. Yeah. So, is there any other questions? I, I need to move on. So, uh, any other questions I, for Holly? And thank you, uh, Frosty, I had for that a update. question kind of related to all of this since talking about the Cobb property started with uh, somebody talking about off leash dogs. And that you mentioned, you know, increased patrols, but there's a, you know, I live a block away from the Highland Natural Area, right? And I've mm -hmm. seen people with off-leash dogs there. They're not running, but, you know, it's like, oh, it's my well-behaved dog and they take the leash off. Um, what can I do? Like, I mean, I've actually said, made a comment, your dog needs to be on a leash. Um, but and and talking about talking about money and all of that coincidentally when that issue showed up on next door about off leash dogs at the Cobb property um <clears throat> later that day i heard a story on the radio about um san diego and if you get a ticket for having your dog off leash where it's not supposed to be off leash 
it's $800. Um, so you could fund a lot of development on the Cobb property with uh, tickets for $800 for people with dogs off leash. Um, I heard about that, that news article as well. That's hilarious. Um, I, I don't see us doing an $800 fine, but I will definitely take that conversation back. Uh, off-leash dogs are, are just a real huge problem. And that is one of the reasons- But, but if there's no consequence, other than a, you know, shake, getting a finger shaking and, you know, a comment from the, the well, mean old lady down the street, um, people are just going to keep doing it. So we do have um, a, a ability to exclude patrons. So that is the consequence. And we have excluded people from all district properties if we've um, had to have multiple conversations with them on the off-leash dog. So, you know, if it's the first time this park patrol person is talking to them, it's not going to result in an exclusion, but we have absolutely excluded multiple repeat offenders. What your question was like, what can I do as a bystander though? Like what, what should I do? Um, I've talked to a lot of people who've had, you know, um, just I'm annoyed by this to really scary experiences and they're calling because something scary <clears throat> happened. And um, listening to all, everyone tell their story and, and digesting that with folks and with our safety services staff, I truly think, and especially within this day and age, right, with you don't know what someone's bringing to a conversation that day um, and what, what might be on their mind and motivating their reactions that have nothing to do with what's in front of them. So instead of approaching the conversation like a, in a more of a rules-focused way, we found it's much more effective to just engage a person to say, hey, I'm sure your dog's great, but my, I'm, I'm terrified of dogs, I'm scared of dogs, or I've got friends that are terrified of dogs, or we've had kids in the neighborhood with terrible experiences, and it really would mean a lot if you'd lease your dog. And it's kind of the way you approach that conversation that can really make a difference. Not that you should, as a patron, feel like you have to, like I'm not suggesting that at all because nobody should do anything that, that they don't feel comfortable doing. Um, but the reality of it is we need more leash, off-leash dog spaces in, in the district. And we're working, um, we have a strategy I was trying to talk about, which was to add dog runs, which are smaller, uh, not meant to be as big as dog parks, but more smaller, localized, neighborhood-sized off-leash area that would attract just the immediate neighbors to walk to. And that's- Sure, I, I get that. But, you know, if I'm, if an off-leash dog actually causes physical, a physical injury, um, at a, at a, you know, a district park that's not designated off leash, um, I'm calling the police. I'm also probably going to file a suit against the district for not enforcing that rule. Um, so, you know, I'm calling the police and animal control, you know, why have a district rule if it's not enforced? You're just, you're waiting for that kind of a situation to happen. I think, and I think, I mean, what I would say is I understand your perspective. I think you have to contextualize it, right? So we do enforce off-leash dog activity. We patrol, we issue exclusions, and every day we have documented conversations with people and have them put their dogs on leash or we exclude, walk them out of the park. So that is happening every day. And it's analogous to the fact that police officers <coughs> people over for speeding every day, but by and large, there's a lot more speeders on the road that didn't get pulled over that day than the fraction that did by the police. So it, it isn't that it isn't enforced, it's that you don't see the speeders getting caught every day and having those conversations. And the problem is bigger than we have the funding, the resources and ability to solve. So it, it really is about trying to give people more options to go to spaces to do the right thing. And for the extreme offenders, you're absolutely right. The consequence has to be painful enough that they'll stop. So Holly, um, I, it's great conversation. Thank you, Debbie. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna try and move us on a little bit. Kevin, you have your hand raised. Uh, is that intentional? Yeah, just I wanted to, to touch on something really quick and then we could move on, Mike. Yeah. Um, Holly and Debbie, uh, just for information, I, I've worked, I worked at THPRD as a park patrol officer for five and a half years. 
um, up until 2014. So I, I do see the district is heading in the right direction by including more dog runs and everything. I have sat personally at Cobb property back when it was just a rental house um, and, and enforced that and excluded people. Same within Highland Forest. Um, I, we, we would do stings all there all the time, just sit up on the property and wait for somebody to come in and then have people go contact them. So it, it just takes a little bit of uh, creativity on the, on those, uh, is it safety services now, Holly? Yeah. Okay, uh, so a little, <laughs> I'm old school, it's park patrol for me. Um, it just takes a little creativity on their part on how they can enforce that, but they do, they will do that. And the exclusions are tough because if they get caught on, a, on any THPRD property within that exclusionary time, it's a criminal trespass in the second degree. It's a criminal, criminal act. So, um, and we have arrested people for that before. Um, so the district's heading in a good spot, but Holly, I, or Debbie, I'm sorry, I do see your concern with the, the off-leash issues on, on certain THPRD properties. Um, if the city can help uh, as far as code enforcement, um, we'd love to try to help, uh, you know, keeping, obviously THPRD is doing a good job of keeping the property mode and everything like that. Um, yeah. But um, but I'm gonna give you an email. Stuff. I'm going to shoot you an email because okay. we need help with city code. We have okay. an issue. So yes, I'm going to shoot. I'm going to take you up on that offer. Okay. Also, I'll put my uh, information in the chat for you, Holly. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, so if the city can help, we're, ha we're happy to help on, on our end um, where we can. But, uh, but yeah, just, and I also work for Beaverton Police Department as a reserve officer. So I see that side of the, the thing too. So calling the police department, Debbie, it may be a good idea. Uh, but animal services is also there, as you mentioned, but they are there to help as well. So just keep those things in mind, I would say. <clears throat> okay, if there's no other questions, Holly, I just have one question, comment for clarification. Uh, we do live, as Frosty mentioned, we live right by the Cobb Park. We walked down there the other day and saw all the new signs. I thought the sign said, as, as well as exclusion, they could be fined $160. Yes, there is a fine. Okay, associated. so there is a fine associated with it. So I just wanted to clarify that that there is on the signs for the Cobb property, they do say you could be fined 160, which is quite a lot of money in my books for not doing what you've been told to do anyway. So hopefully uh, they will abide by that. But again, thank you very much, Holly. I appreciate you coming with us, and thank you for a very good update. Um, thank you. So Elena, it's your turn, and. Uh, You've had, had some very powerful updates from others. So you, you got a challenge today. <laughs> yeah, um, I just have a couple of things. Um, the first thing is the Patricia Research Center for the Arts or um, the Reeser is here with an exciting grand opening se spring season. Um, the new Performing Arts Center located in downtown Beaverton will feature special performances with many shows from regional visiting presenters from across the metro area. Um, a community celebration did happen on Sunday, March 13th, but um, I was also looking at the website and they, it looks like there's a lot of things going on in the future. Um, and it is near the round between um, Southwest Cedar Hills and then Southwest Hall. Um, it features a 550 seat theater, art gallery, meeting space, outdoor plaza and adjacent parking structure. And um, I could, put in the chat um, the website for that after all of the updates. Um, the next thing is that the city is now offering expanded in-person services across all city facilities while continuing virtual services for community members. While many city services were already being offered in person, other services have been added and may look different from previously offered, such as by appointment. Virtual services that have proven effective are likely to continue as far as they meet the city's service models and public needs. The changes are happening as the latest waves of the pandemic subsides with international efforts, uh, or sorry, intentional efforts to improve the ways residents and community members across, um, access city programs and resources. Um, the city remains committed to health and safety during this time and visitors and staff are encouraged to continue practicing all public health guidelines. And to learn more about city services, um, you can always visit the website. And then the city council meeting schedule is also changing starting this month. Um, the regular city council meetings will occur on the first and third Tuesday of each month with the fourth Tuesday of each month held for um, Beaverton Urban Redevelopment Agency or the Bureau meetings. 
While subject to change, it is anticipated that the first meeting of each month will occur in person in council chambers, but remote participation will still be offered, including for visitor, for visitor comments from the public. Um, the city council will no longer meet on the second or fourth Tuesday of the month unless a special council meeting is required. And there are a couple upcoming exceptions that will occur on um, when the city council meets May 10th, 2022, um, in observance of a holiday, and then also due to a primary election already scheduled um, in May. And then, so upcoming city council meetings, um, I guess the two of for March have already passed, but uh, there will be a couple in April, and then I can also send the link to those. And then lastly, the state of the city is on March 29th. Um, so please make sure to tune in Tuesday, March 29th at 12 p.m. for Beaverton Voices State of the City 2022 with the mayor. Um, the event will premiere on the city's website and social media. And some of the major topics will include Beaverton's ongoing response to COVID-19, economic recovery, downtown redevelopment, um, ARPA funding, and addressing homelessness. And you definitely would not want to miss this. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions for Elena? So Elena, uh, again, sorry, I'm, I'm asking all the questions, but um, we've heard a lot about Portland and their um, street dining and how and the plans that they're going to carry to extend that. Do you have any understanding of what's going to happen with the on-street dining that we have down in Beaverton at the moment? I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I can go. I I can ask about that, and I also think there were a couple like different redevelopment plans for um, Beaverton downtown. So I'm sure that um, there will be presentations or something that would clarify that a little right. more. Yeah, there's okay. there's a place down in the uh, down. I can't. I think it's on Main. They're close to Main Street where the road's been closed and they've had um, on-street dining there for some time. I didn't know if they were gonna lose that or not, but uh, thank you. If you can find that out, that would be very helpful. Are there any other questions um, before we move on? Okay, again, thank you very much, Elena. Uh, I'm not sure, Miles, uh, Frosty, are you gonna give the BCCI update or is it between you and Debbie? I wasn't sure. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I've got the agenda here. I can talk off of it, and, and I think Barry was not able to attend. Um, the uh, for everybody's reference, uh, the the new chair of the BCCI meeting has been to uh, Fode uh, Kamokie. Um, really nice lady. She's pretty, relatively new to be able but been, been very involved with this, and she does a really great job. Um, the council liaison is the city councilor Nadia Hassan, Hassan and uh, some of the topics that we discussed. And I did send to you, Mike, and I think it's, it's available um, to send out to the NAC participants tonight a um, PowerPoint presentation on the draft code for the housing option project. Rob Zoller, uh, the associate planner of community development, gave quite a presentation on this and it's it's quite controversial as far as I'm concerned uh, and many others uh, and it's a result of the uh, state legislature passing uh, a bill 2001 that uh, in essence here, let me pull this I don't think I can show this to you all but uh, let me give you the official word wording for this um, the goal is to update the development code to allow a mix of housing types at a range of price levels in the city's residential areas. And it's an attempt to provide affordable housing to people who in many cases uh, may need to work in Beaverton but can't afford to live in some of the houses. So an extreme example is if I chose to tore down my house on Sexton Mountain Court, uh, and build a duplex or triplex, uh, potentially up to four units, uh, given that the property that would support that is there, uh, my neighbors couldn't do anything about it. Um, 
Uh, so that's that's an extreme example. I don't see that happening, but um, there's a really good um, a uh, PowerPoint that describes it and the process. Oh, here it is. The phases. <clears throat> the phase one was identify the issue that's been completed. Phase two, explore alternatives that's been completed. Pay, phase three, select alternatives. And then phase four, which is winter of 2021 and to the summer of 2022, is phase four is to implement the strategies. Um, draft and refine code updates, draft comprehensive plan updates, collect public input on updates, and continue uh, racial equity analyses so that uh, this can, uh, th so that we can be a more inclusive, economically inclusive. I might, uh, that's a, from the popped in my head uh, that would maybe be helpful for people who work but may not be able to afford to live in Beaverton. Um, the other items on the agenda that we discussed, um, there's actually a group um, and I think Holly, uh, uh, I, I, this is not a uh, Twelve and Parks issue, but it's a, it's a, a year of trees project. Rachel Phillips is the vice chair of Central Beaverton NAC. Um, I know that some of the NAC uh, uh, grants, uh, Highland Hills has done this. Uh, the Central Beaverton project is to take as much of the development that's taken uh, maybe some houses out or some green spaces out uh, to plant more trees in making it as green as possible with some of the I wouldn't call them high rises, but some of the apartments, complexes, or or uh, multi-family uh, uh, facilities that are being built, and and also Highland Hills NAC has been doing a tree planting uh, grant almost for quite a few, quite a while now, uh, and that's one of their projects that they've done. And one of the questions I had at BCCI was, are these in conflict? Or are they are participatory? Or are they a crop collaborating together. Uh, they know of each other, but they're both doing tree planting stuff, uh, but in different areas. Um, uh, Lonnie gave an update on the community service and engagement department. Uh, then we, uh, we didn't have any matching grants to discuss. Uh, the event committee uh, is getting kicking into gear because uh, this was just in February, the end of February. So uh, there'll be some more events that'll be uh, being discussed. Oh, I know one of them is going to be a, uh, a voters forum on April 28th. Uh, and there's a subcommittee chair, Eric Lair, uh, Lair is going to be the chair for that. And moderators are Dory King and Bintu Fode Um Those will be the moderators. So the voters forum is for the primaries for uh, uh, for the general election coming up in November, but also for seats. I think I'm pretty sure there's some council seats that are open. Um, I think is it Mark Sansusi that's or who's retired or his time has run up. Plus there's four of, council seats that are up. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Deb, for that. Um, so that that'll be a those will be some candidates for those seats that will probably be in that November, uh, April 28th uh, voters forum. And so that's, Debbie, or do you have anything to add to that? Uh, just that the voters form will be in person and I believe at the RESER. Oh yeah, that's right. That'll be an opportunity to use the research for that. That'd be great. That's great. Thank you very much, Frosty. And thank you, Debbie, um, for the updates. Um, any other questions for Frosty for the BCCI? Okay, so I have one question, um, Frosty, that you can take back. So um, as I go around Beaverton, I see all these wonderful multi-dwelling properties that they keep putting up. If you go down Jump Farm, not Jump Farm, we call it Jump Farm, uh, down Roy Rogers Road, you can see all of these wonderful new buildings they're putting up, multi-story, four-story, um, everywhere you look, they've been building them. Um, I don't see much effort in making them um, 
what did you call them, affordable housing, because all of the prices of those are up in the four, 400 to five, 400 to $500,000 homes. So with all of these wonderful changes that we seem to be making to try and make affordable housing, and I agree with it because I have several sons who cannot afford to buy a house here that mm -hmm. would have to live further away because there's just no way that we, they could afford it. Um, I'm wondering when are we going to get to a position with what the BCCI, what the um, development committees are working on and how they're going to actually make these houses affordable and not just more houses, higher pack density, but they're no more affordable than the ones that are already here. Um, and I'm just wondering if they're ever going to address that, because I think that's going to make it very hard for even if you tore your house down and put four duplex in there, I'm pretty sure they'd probably be 350 to 400,000 a piece. So that, that wouldn't be any help to people that are trying to start in a housing environment. Well, but, you're absolutely right. And <clears throat> I want to try to be careful here, but we, our government has created this problem. When, you know, but at the same token, you don't want to go out and just wipe out all the farmlands and build houses around it like California's done. Uh, so at the same time, there's got to be a balance between land in, in the land use discussion. Um, and so when you start, when, when, when you over-regulate, well, let me, let me, I've, I don't have a degree in physics, but I've got a lot of science classes because of pharmacy and biology and stuff. But there's a physics law for every action, there's an opposite equal, opposite and equal reaction. Unfortunately, a lot of politicians don't pay attention to that. So I, I have a grandson who's 23, uh, will be 24 in uh, June, uh, she's Jan, uh, yeah, June, and he just got married in September. Uh, he's minimum wage. He just got accepted for an apprenticeship and seam fitting, uh, but he's had to move twice now uh, to a place that he can afford. And what really worries me is that he has bought a motorcycle. Uh, it's not the safest vehicle to travel, particularly this time of the year. Um, and because, uh, you know, and when we shut down our energy production and gas is $7, five to, I mean, I've, I've been in a couple of places in the last two months where it's pushing $6 a gallon and, and up. So we create these problems and then we try to solve them. And um, you're absolutely right. How do you build houses that people can afford? Okay. Um, my, and, my comment, Frosty, was more yeah. of, is that, can you take that feedback back to the BCCI and, and I can yes. be part of whatever that is, but um, I- you get, you get what you vote for. That's right. my summary. And, right. and well, people, so, so part of what the, the state law that was passed is changing in zoning to allow more types of housing <laughs> in different areas. And right. so more types of housing is, some of that is more affordable housing um, in terms of, you know, where Beaverton <laughs> is limited by uh, the urban growth boundary, um, but also part of the Cooper Mountain plan, and right now all of Cooper Mountain is not in the city of Beaverton, but I believe that it is projected to be and become part of the city of Beaverton at some point, and part of the Cooper Mountain plan includes affordable housing specifically. Um, but you also run into an issue like Portland has run into in terms of developers who agree to build housing and have a percentage of it be affordable housing. And they, it's a handshake agreement and they end up building that housing and not following through on that agreement of it, of affordable housing being included. And there's no recourse for that after the fact. So. Um, it's yeah, it's driven by by government and economics, but that's part of this housing options project is is increasing where different types of housing can be built because it, it just I'm I'm not an economist, I'm not a housing expert, but a unit in a 
in a duplex is going to be less expensive than a 5,000 square foot house on a 7,000 square foot lot. Right. So, so that's all part of this. The other comment that I would make about taking this information to BCCI oh, is okay. all we can do is advise. We don't make the decisions for planning Correct. commission. Correct. So, oh. But it's just advising them of, you know, where are we, it's, I'm, I'm probably getting at a step here, but um, it's a bit like the same comment with the dog, the dog run. You know, if we're not going to do something about it, all we're doing is we're making more rules, more things to try and help solve the problem. But if we look at it from a systemic point of view, it's not fixing the problem. So well, whereas well, we my, had, whereas we had the Tolerton Parks and Rec said we're going to build more runs to get away from having to have people running dogs in areas they shouldn't be, we're getting back into the same situation. Right. I, I don't right. want to, Frosty. I understand it can be a very emotional. So I'm. Well, no, no, I was no, just no, trying no. to make a point of taking it there's back one, to them and saying, right, "There's one make other sure thing. Works, one so. other thing. This is passed by the Oregon legislature." This is a right. done deal. 2001, right. the bill, not not year 2001, but the bill is 2001. I, I don't know if it's a, a Senate or a House bill, but it passed and was signed by the governor. This is mandated to every single community in the state of Oregon. Do you think every single community in the state of Oregon is the same? No, it's not. So the devil will be in the details. Um, and but I think as a city of Beaverton, we have the ability to uh, to try and work through it as we not really, it. not really. Okay, not really. So let's That's, let's put a let's yeah. put a cap on that about because yeah. I I don't want to take more time yeah. out because we're we're coming up to a, the next um the next part on the the school yeah. district uh, bond measure. So well, I want to keep I, the dialogue just, open. Sorry, I just want to oh. say I am going to take all these comments to the housing technical advisory group, which I sit on. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, you know the the purpose of that group is largely to talk about these kinds of issues, affordable housing. Uh, and I had a conversation with uh, Javier Mena, who's the like affordable. He's like the housing lead for the city. Um, years ago, like three or four years ago, where I basically said the same thing you're saying, Mike, of like, well, what can we do? Why, you know, how can we change this? Uh, so I'm totally with you, and I'll take this feedback to the group next. Uh, we have a meeting next week, so. Okay, I, I really appreciate it because I think yeah. we are we are meeting here because we care for the city of Beaverton. I care for people being able to afford a house because you know, we all have grandkids or kids that can't afford to live here anymore and don't really want to move to Bend or somewhere just to be able to buy a house, you know, or buy a motorbike so we can get that far. You know, so it is important and I think it behoves us as a as a neighborhood association to to, to try and work through these things to help those that need the help. And again, if we're going to pull down these big houses and stick loads of little ones, there's no, there's no point if, and I think Debbie, it was like the property just by you, they were going to put what, nine houses in there? And they were all about 450,000 a piece. And it's like, well, that didn't help anything. So nope. it would be very useful to be able to do something effective in that way. Yeah. Okay, so again, thank you everyone. I, I'm just going to close it down just because of the the time and being able to move forward but aaron the the second aaron um thank you so much for being patient sorry i should have clarified it earlier but thank you for coming to our NAC and um please brief us on the uh, new beaverton school district proposals for the bond measure yeah absolutely thank you so much for having me tonight so my name is aaron boyle i work for the beaverton school district my job is as the administrator for facilities development. So I actually oversee the bond program. Um, so I know a lot about what we're doing there. So I have a couple videos to show you all tonight. Um, so I'll get to those in a second, but just kind of in a, you know, a, a quick nutshell here, we're uh, looking at going out for a bond election this May. So the bond is the primary mechanism that we use to fund the facilities in the school district. So any new schools, uh, remodels, repairs, um, you know, new roofing, HVAC, that sort of thing is all funded through these bonds. And so when we when we go out for the bond election, we're looking ahead for the next six years and how are we going to maintain the buildings over that period of time. So I'm going to show a couple of videos right now, and then I will um, 
I'll show you some information on the website and how to navigate that here. So, <clears throat> so here's the website and all the videos are just right here on the website. And I put the, the link to the website in the, uh, the chat here. Thank you. Okay, so there's the, the main overview video of the bond and I'll show another video here uh, also. But first, let me show you how to navigate this website. A uh, lot of really good information on here. Um, you can look, you can click on any of these tabs and see information about any specific projects that you might be interested in. Uh, there's also a tab on here that talks about the 2014 bond, uh, if you're curious what was done in that bond as well. 
Um, and as you scroll down the page there, you can click into each of these different categories, you know, learn more about the modernization projects or the seismic upgrades. Um, there's some financial information on here and kind of how to uh, determine what the, the property tax impact might be for your specific situation. And then here there, there's uh, some frequently asked questions. Uh, the reports that she talked about in the video, like the conditions assessment and long range facility plan, tons of great information. Really, I would say for this, the planning for this bond is, has far more detail to it than really we've ever had in the past. So really excited about that information and, and how it helps inform the process here. And then a spot to ask questions, to submit questions. And we, we get back to those pretty quickly. So, Frosty, it looks like you have a question. Why don't I get your question before I play the other video? Well, first, my wife was a uh, was a teacher, uh, and my daughter was a teacher. So, and obviously, I wouldn't have gotten where I was if it wasn't for teachers. But I'm curious uh, if we're providing every student with a remote learning device. What happens to them when they either transfer to uh, or move or graduate, and uh, if we're doing remote learning, or do we need all the buildings? Good question. So the plan is not to do remote learning. Um, I but, hope so. I hope it is. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely because, not the plan. Seriously, remote learning has, has has taken our kids out for at least a year. Yeah, if not more. I absolutely agree. And we, yeah, we don't want to be doing remote learning. As far as the technology, they're checked in and out uh, every year at the beginning and end of the year. So, um, you know, if a student transfers, they would need to return the device before uh, they leave. And are there any uh, penalties if they are misused or destroyed? Yeah, um, this isn't my area of expertise, but I, they do do deposits. Um, so there are there are penalties for those. And I knew I do know that they, they you know, certainly there's accidents and stuff all the time. So they use those those deposits to, to fund the repairs to the devices. Okay. All right, so let me play our second video here. It's about the seismic upgrade projects in the bond. And I'll, I'll probably cut this video off a little bit early just because some of the information repeats from the last video. So don't be shocked when I uh, turn it off here. In May 2022, voters will decide on a new proposed 30-year bond that, if passed, would raise about $723 million. Part of the bond money would go to seismic upgrades in school buildings. Take a look at this graph. 13 of our 53 schools currently meet or nearly meet the district's goal for damage control, leaving 40 of our schools that don't meet the district's standard for earthquake readiness. If passed, the proposed bond would fund phase one of that work, starting with our older middle schools, Cedar Park, Five Oaks, Highland Park, Meadow Park, Mountain View, and Whitford. Other schools would be addressed in future proposed bonds. To understand what these proposed projects would entail, we've asked construction project manager Eric Bolkin to explain. First, I would like to say a thank you to my daughters, Layla and Natalie, for letting me use their Lego today. Here is a simple example of how many older buildings in the district are constructed. We have these larger posts that support the structure above. I can put pressure straight down on the building and it's very strong resisting that force. However, in an earthquake, the ground doesn't move up and down, it moves back and forth, which then puts a different force on the structure, making them want to tip over. And so as the ground shakes in an earthquake, the structures have a tendency to tip over. The goal of our seismic upgrades is to make sure that doesn't happen. So one way that we go about strengthening the buildings is to add shear walls. This is an example of a shear wall. You can see it's thinner than the posts, often made from plywood that's applied to existing framed walls. What we do is we build the shear wall infilling between the posts. Then we attach the shear wall to the posts with clips at the top and bottom of the wall, typically. 
Then we also attach the shear wall as well as the posts to the structure above. Like so. Now, as the same motion happens, the shear wall stays, the unsupported wall does not. So all we have to do is turn all the walls into shear walls, right? Well, luckily we don't have to because we hire structural engineers who help us decide where to install these shear walls and then direct us on how we can collect the force that's being exerted on these unsupported walls. And then we can strap the unsupported over to where we've added the shear wall. So now as one big unit, the whole thing stays connected. Our upgrades also include making sure the electrical service, the fire sprinklers, the natural gas are all functional in the event of an earthquake, as well as making sure heavier elements such as ceilings and lighting don't fall down uh, as an earthquake happens. That is a very simple explanation of why and how we implement seismic upgrades on our buildings. The proposed bond is estimated to initially cost taxpayers approximately $2.34 per $1,000 of assessed value and to Okay, I'll stop with that. That just kind of repeats from the last video. Um, and in fact, I can stop screen sharing now. So, um, a lot of information there. Um, you know, the seismic upgrades are, are really a big part of this bond. We, uh, as you saw, a lot of our schools are not upgraded seismically. And so we're trying to go through and, and upgrade the ones that make sense. Um, and you saw there's the six of the older middle schools are included in the next bond for upgrades. Um, so I think that's kind of it for the presentation there. I'm happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Aaron, I had a question. Uh, um, for as long as I've lived in Beaverton, it's been a while, uh, it seems like we put those bond measures on in May when it's not like a major election, it's like a primary election. And so often, practically every time this comes up, it seems like, you know, we don't have enough voters to meet the requirement for the number of, you know, for the majority to raise the taxes right and so it's always like oh we didn't have enough voters man we got to roll it over to the next to the general where usually there's enough voters so i'm kind of wondering is that like intentional to sort of like say hey we got to <laughs> no. get it up no okay Not so you honestly feel like the, it's a better strategy to put the election on you know, a less popular election where it's not likely to get the number of voters. I know this is probably, this may be not part of your, you know, your job. Yeah, but you're right just, about that I've part. just always wondered um, about it. I don't think there is actually a requirement anymore for a minimum number of voters. So I, oh. I, I believe it's just a simple majority. I'm pretty okay. sure about that. I, oh. I think it used to be the case, but it's oh. not, it's no longer the case. Okay, well, that's cool. I, I didn't but, know that, but it's always made me wonder. Without being over cynical, then that makes it easier for them to get it in because less people are voting for it. So. <laughs> don't be cynical, Mike. You're, you're, you're no, no, I, I, I don't mind keep paying for all these upgrades. Strategic. I live in my house and I it's pay strategic. all this money. Yes, Dude, all my kids strategic. are not at school anymore. Yeah, yeah. I do so, know it is we do want to align these with presidential elections in in the future. So we're we're like off that cycle right now by a few years. So I, yeah. this is actually a six year bond, and the the, the purpose. And intent behind that was to align it with the the not the next but the, the following presidential election got it i had a just for clarification um there is a bond that's expiring this year right right that so was... the 2014 bond um yes that is what we have been executing over the last years the last eight years it, it is wrapping up there will be a few projects that go into next summer but it basically we're at the but, end of that bond. But if this doesn't pass in May, then the that money that's you know, my property taxes right now that are going towards that bond would not be assessed 
I mean, there'd still be school taxes, but in terms of whatever it is for that bond, um, if if this doesn't pass, then those taxes would not still be. Um, sort of. So I would refer you to the the website for that. So okay. So the bond when I when I say it's an eight year bond, the construction is eight years. The okay. actual payoff time the, the amount of time you'll see it on your property taxes is like 30 years okay so there is a step off uh but it's not for the 2014 bond right so but this isn't it's a it's not a it's not a tax on top of a tax because right there is a bond that's expiring this year so correct yes right okay thank you hey. sorry i, I didn't mean to sorry Lisa, go ahead. Thanks. I just had one kind of more like, I guess, a comment sort of question. Um, and I'll preface it by saying, I mean, I have a kid and another on the way. So I do care about the schools. Uh, and I think everyone should care about the schools. But when you think about maybe people who don't have children or like are less likely to like care about the schools, um, would you, isn't it, isn't it true that the uh, schools are generally seen as a community resource for uh, emergency shelter and so like a really good reason to make sure they're seismically upgraded yes I great mean, question yeah absolutely so the, the the seismic upgrades is a big part of it so when we build new schools we do and when we do the the retrofits at the schools to seismically upgrade them we do work with red cross to get those schools established as community shelters so below yeah. a high school just recently had a really big seismic upgrade um, and so we're working with the Red Cross to have a load designated as a, a shelter. Absolutely. Yes. And it's so awesome. we want all the schools to be that. Yeah. I mean, I, and that like, it's, it's so, you know, logical, right? They're in the neighborhood. They're right there. People know where they are. Like, yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's good to know. Like, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. That's a great question. And, and Aaron, I just want to clarify, I am not cynical about schools. I think they're very important. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. No um, the, the comment about the two dollars and thirty-four cents per thousand does does that incorporate the fact that one bond measure is going off? So are we going to get anything back out of that bond measure, or is that including the fact that we've already taken that piece out of it? So is it is it a net two dollars thirty-four cents increase with the bond going off? Because I take it we stopped paying for a bond. Yeah, the end of 22. Uh, let me do the test here. So the increase based on voting for this bond is a net like 25 cent. And I'm speaking roughly and there's an estimated number. Right. It's about a 25 cent increase. If the bond did not pass and the other bond came off, it's like a 25 cent decrease, roughly speaking. I believe the numbers are on the website. I and I would okay. it there, but I'll, I'll clarify that because it's um Playing, 225 is the, the total afterwards, but that's not that's not the increase. That that's the the, the total tax rate. Okay, all right. I and I appreciate you clarifying it because as you play with numbers, sometimes it gives a false perception of what people are paying for. So yeah. Okay. Is there any other questions? And I thank you very much for coming to our our NAC and explaining that. I appreciate it, and I think the video is very helpful too because people can go back and go through it again uh, I think that's helpful yeah absolutely and like I said if I definitely encourage you to go if you any other questions come up submit them on that website uh, we're pretty quick about responding to those and even posting them okay. to the FAQ sometimes so all right uh, thank you thank you so much again, for having me. thank you very much for coming for joining us okay we're now on to um, our BCCI ideas for consideration for joining NAC programs so I put that in there probably to be a cryptic enough um, to inspire some interest. So as you know, or for those that are involved in the BCCI, you know that people have been going around and asking if there are joint programs that we could do um, as individual NACs. So instead of everyone doing their own NAC thing, um, that we could join a couple of them together. So what I wanted to do just to make you aware of some of the things that have been discussed um, and also get your feedback and maybe get your thinking juices about you know, what do we really want to do? Um, how do we want to uh, address this? Um, 
Miles told me- My, Michael, you're talking about yes. the grants, grant programs, right? Well, it's part of the grant program, but instead of South Beaverton Ag going and, well, Highland it's, doing tree planting, they say, okay, well, why don't two NACs join together yes. and they do tree planting together? Yeah, it, it's partnering on grant programs. Right, yes, it's, it's partnering it's a, on those things together. Yeah, so, not, not with BCCI, but but it's the NACs it, partnering, yeah. Got it. Yes, that's, that's correct. So it came from an inspiration from the BCCI, so that's where the BCCI correct. was involved in it. Um, so Miles told me at the beginning of the week that they have been given the go ahead that if we wanted to do a summer event this year, we can. Um, uh, my response was, that's great, but we need to find out whether the schools are going to actually give us the ability to use their property because without it, we, we don't have a big enough area to do anything. So he's going to come back to me. So I just want you to be thinking from a, a NAC perspective, you know, are we fixed in a position that we can do an event? Maybe we don't want to do something as adventurous as the business and the movie night. Maybe we want to do something smaller. But I do want you to be thinking about that and the time commitment um, it will take um, and what we want to do as an act, whether we want to move forward on that. One of the suggestions that I did get from, um, I forgot the name of the person that was running it, but uh, she said that they are looking to try and do a CERT program this year, uh, similar to what they did in the city. Uh, they did one in the city of Beaverton where they just made people aware. It's something that I feel we should be doing as a neighborhood is saying, well, are people prepared if the big earthquake would happen, that would be something we'd all be involved in and we would really need to know how are we going to deal with it. And I don't think there's a lot of focus on that at the moment with all the other things going on. So I thought that may be a useful program for us to join. They said that there is a possibility of us joining with one other NAC. So two NACs could be together on this so we could do our volunteer hours and everything else. So I just wanted to share those things with you and ask, um, you know, our numbers are down a little bit on what they have been, but I wanted to know if people are interested in becoming part of that and how much energy does people have to try and do something this summer. Um, so I'll let you mull that over. Um, we, I know we've had a couple of things and Lisa, I wanted to give you an opportunity to go through yours. If you have something you want to talk about, you can share things if you've got uh, any updates or you can just talk to it. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. You mentioned that you, you could go through the art program. Yeah. That you were no, about. absolutely. No, you're not putting me on the spot. I was planning on it, but I know we only have like 13 minutes left. I don't know. Okay. Um, just give us a high level overview and then I'll put more time on next month. Okay. Well, I do have to do the uh grant before next month so maybe we can try to meet um yeah i'm more, like, more than happy to meet with you to get the grant put me together and you and maybe debbie if she's yep, available that would be great um, okay so i can email you two and we can try to meet to like i can take a stab at the grant application myself um and then we can just meet to maybe just finalize it but um L Laura uh, said that she is very uh, optimistic that we would get it. <laughs> okay. Because she basically said that, I mean, it's really the purpose of the grant is for exactly like what we're trying to do, you know, something outside of downtown, like really in the neighborhood. Um, so that was really good. I think I can do this quickly enough that I'll try uh, to share my screen. Is this working? Let's see, hold on. Lisa, while you're doing that, uh, I'm one of the approving people, so. Oh, you are? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let nice. me know about it. And okay. If I, see, if I see anything that, I, I don't know what it is yet, but if I see anything that might be a question, I'll probably let you know. Okay, you awesome. Know. Thank you. I think there's only three of us in, or two okay. of us. So. So these are the photos that we took. Can everybody see these? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So they're not coming. I guess I sent them like small, like small resolution because uh, it was taking so long to download. But um, this was like along the path. So we met at Weir and then we walked north. And this was, uh, I forget the name of the street, to be honest. I'm still working on the street names. But we talked about like 
if we wanted to do something standalone, we could probably use some of these kinds of pieces of land on the uh, sides because they are probably like publicly owned. Um, but really we discussed that it would be better probably if we did focus on um, on the crosswalk at Weir, which I think this is there, um, because she was talking about how great it would be if it was visible from the sidewalk and even the road. And so um, basically like the, the vision that we kind of gathered as we walked uh, was if we could have, if we did something on the pavement, right? Like we talked about in our last meeting, and it would have like um, little vignettes, she kind of called it, that would lead up to then the crosswalk. And then there would be something like, uh, again, still on the pavement, but really vibrant and colorful and kind of fill like a certain area of the pavement um, on either side of the crosswalk, either side of the sidewalk, you know, uh, on the actual path. And so that way, you know, kids would see it when they walk to school, because that's the, that goes straight to the school. And so kids, you know, will walk to school that way or parents drive to school or drive to pick up. So that's kind of the vision that we like thought is probably like the best fit. And what I, but she also said that we don't even need to have it like fully confirmed before we put the grant in. So she's like, just put the grant in because it's due this month. So she's like, just put the grant in and then we can like keep working on it. Um, so yeah, so that's the plan with the grant. Uh, and, and again, we can we can do, I think Miles already confirmed this, but just to double confirm, we can do both grants. We can do the Art Lives Here and the matching grant. They're not like, you know, mutually exclusive. So that's great. That's even more money than I thought we could get, which is awesome. Um, and then the last thing I was gonna say uh, is just time frame. The painting has to be done when it's dry. So <laughs> we are kind of looking at, like we do have to, it, it is kind of good that the grant is due this month and it kind of gets like, gets us going because we pretty much have to, we'd have to get it painted this summer. Otherwise we're waiting till next summer is really what it would, what it would look like. Cause it has to be like totally dry and then they have to like pre-treat it and all this stuff. So um, just some, you know, really good feedback and info that she gave. She's super on our side, really excited for us. Um, you know, and really thinks this is like a, a great thing. Um, like I said, the whole point of the grant program art lives here was to bring art to the neighborhoods like we're doing. So it's good. Okay. How permanent That's is great. that? How permanent are those? Oh, three to so, three ish years. And that is, we talked about that too, Mike, that um, it would be something where it would be basically decommissioned after three years. And you know, they they would probably like clean it off and take it off just because it wouldn't look good anymore anyway after a certain amount of time. Um, but I did explain to her, Mike, your idea about basically kind of renewing it rather than just right. letting it disappear. We would have a new group of uh, maybe students, a new artist help to lead a new effort in three years. And she thought that was great. So. Okay. That's great. Cool. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that update. Sure. Um, Fantastic, Lisa. Thank you. That's good. Thanks. No. Thanks. Yeah, I'm really. Excited. Although I still like the idea of the 30 foot tall fork, but you know, this is <laughs> this is a good Plan B. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think we're about to go with the Plan B. The, the sculptures are really expensive. I don't know if you want to spend twenty thousand dollars on this on a yeah, fork. Both grants, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of hours we have to work, yeah. David. I'm I'm pleased you're signing up for it before we even start. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, a great update. We and again, if you set up a meeting, whatever you need to do, um, I, I will. I'm more than happy to give time into this to get it sorted awesome. out. Thank you. Yeah, I'll work on the grant and then I'll I'll email uh, you and Debbie and we can go from there. Okay. Michael, um, uh, Michael, another yes. one of the one of the ideas was since I I still mm -hmm. haven't heard uh, and I'm on a, a volunteer for the police department. They haven't been doing their um, uh, shredding events. And so I know Highland did a, a shredding event and we talked about possibly partnering with another one to do a shredding event. And that may be something that um, 
two or three BCCIs could, uh, uh, NACs could right. uh, do it together and coordinate it with the BCCI <laughs> meetings too, but. Um, okay, uh, I, will, shredding, I will take shredding, that. Shredding's a big issue because of identity theft and everything, so. But right, it doesn't look and that's like something we've thing. had on the cards for some time, I, yeah. I agree. I really think we should uh, push that one forward. Because the police aren't, don't, don't look like they're gonna be doing it anymore, for at least for now. Okay. So the next on the round table um, agendas, uh, next month we have um, some elections coming up and the DA is asked to come and present. Um, we will be getting other DA representatives to come and join us at the meeting. So next week we'll, next month we'll be covering that um, as well. Uh, the other question or the other round table item I had for us is, um, Several people got involved with the NAC quarterly last month. Um, it is coming up on the 24th and they wanted me to ask just to say, if, if you can make it, it would be really great to get inputs from other NACs. Um, it's on the 24th and I think if you yeah. respond to the invite you've received, um, they'll be able to set you up with a Zoom meeting. I don't think it's in person. Okay. Any other roundtable items anyone has before we before we ask Debbie for how much money do we have? But, hey, uh, this invite you're talking about this this I haven't seen anything. Oh, we that. told her not to send it to you because you talk okay, too much. Got it. So, got it. But no, Good. I'll I'll Good. get it and send it to you, David, so that you can come. Right. Hey, did anyone else not get it? Shall I send it around to all the all the board members? <coughs> Sorry, Frosty, you're muted. What is it? What is it again? Uh, it's the quarterly NAC meeting where they get all the NAC program meetings, uh, NAC meeting groups leaders. together, leaders together. But we actually open it up to other board members if they want to come as well. So we had several people last time. I will send it around to everyone. That way everyone's got it. Um, okay. Um, we need to vote on David becoming a BCCI rep. Um, if David, if you're okay, I'd like to move that out till next month. As I mentioned on my email, I just want to get some prep done beforehand. And I yep, want to talk to good. Frosty and also to, to Gary as well. I have to work on my campaign anyway. Well, yeah, we, I've already got the pins made for you. Oh, so. fantastic. Then I've, yard signs. I've, yeah, the, I've got a couple of yard signs that you can paint over. Good. So Debbie, um, would you like to give us our financial update? The financial update is uh, unchanged from last month's update. Our uh, bank balance is $7,649.22. Okay. Well, I have to keep asking myself the question, we probably need to put this into a, an account where we get at least five cents interest. So that will give you something more to talk about each month. Well, that was actually one of the one of the questions that I asked Miles in terms of the whole the whole process for setting up the account and all of that that right um, and and he sent me an email about you know having having all the NAC accounts centralized basically at at the city um, not that the city would be the banker but um, anyway but yeah an interest you know it would seem like in the interest of being supportive of the community that US Bank or any other financial institution would wanna, wanna do, uh, do the city and the neighborhoods a solid and you know, give, them, give them the best deal for choosing to do their banking there. But right. that's not a decision that I, that I can make, so. <laughs> right, well, uh, we can talk, we can take that up with Miles again. All right, well, I thank you very much. We are gonna finish spot on time. I do appreciate everyone uh, coming and participating in the meeting. Um, I look forward to seeing you all next week or next month, sorry. Shouldn't say next week, you give you a heart attack. Or well, well, looking forward to seeing you all next month. And again, thank you everyone for spending your time and, and being part of this meeting. Thank you, Elena, for all you well did. Well, Kevin, uh, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for coming. I think my Kevin has some Kevin updates. Kevin had a couple of Okay, minutes. sorry, Kevin.
No worries. I just need just a, a quick minute or so. Um, I just want to remind everybody that code compliance is still out here and uh, we're, we're help, able to help with any code issues in, that you may be uh, having or, or witnessing. Um, with spring around the corner, a lot of people are uh, starting to do home improvement projects uh, outdoors. So if you are having bark dust or any kind of building material delivered, please, please, please try to put it on your property uh, that does not block the sidewalk or the streets. Uh, we're seeing a big uptick in um, bark chips and uh, other building materials being placed in the streets and it's causing traffic issues. Um, also with that, uh, uh, basketball hoops are another big thing we're seeing now. We, we understand that Kids need to play outside and we're, we fully support that. We just ask the basketball hoops to come off of the street uh, in the evenings uh, or when they're not being used so that they are um, out of the way for vehicles and emergency vehicles if necessary. Um, if you need any of our contact information, you can find it on the city website um, or you can, uh, I can put it in the chat as well. And, uh, but we're, we're around. So if you have any questions, uh, fire away. Uh, Kevin, I thank you very much for that reminder. Um, we had an incident here recently where someone had a bunch of gravel delivered in the road. They put it on a tarp and then folded the top over. So at night there was no street light. So you had this great big mound of something in the road. Any car coming around there could have quite easily gone over it. So um, I appreciate you uh, reminding us of that. And I tell you, we, do we just report those types of instances to you? Yes, uh, just you can report them on the website, uh, the co-compliance website um, at our report a problem. Uh, you can report them directly to one of us. And I, again, I'll put my contact information in the chat here real quick. Um, but that, that you know, I, I, I have personally had that issue where somebody did put a uh, pile of gravel in the roadway on a road that's not, not heavily trafficked, but still trafficked. And, and I was paying attention to something else in my emergency, in my, my patrol vehicle. And I ended up hitting that gravel pile This is several years ago, but uh, it, it, it does cause a big issue. Flags and cones are great, but they're, again, it's not allowed. It's, it's, uh, it's a big code violation and, and to block that roadway. So uh, yes, okay. report directly to us and then we're happy to take care of that. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, Elena, can you uh, send the chat out like you did last time? All the stuff that's in the chat column. I'd appreciate that. Okay. Um, sorry, to your email? Yeah, if you send it to my email, then I'll send it out to everyone else. Okay, sounds great. Okay. Again, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the weekend. And uh, thank you for being part of this SNAC meeting. And I'll speak to you again next week or next month. I keep saying that. Next month. It seems like it goes around very quickly. So it's almost like a week. But thank you. Mm -hmm. Good night all. Yep. Be safe. Mike.